Good morning. Before we start, there's a wee quiz. And whoever gets the answer right gets a fisherman's friend. Nobody's going to get it right then. If you look at your uh, intimation sheet, a deliberate mistake in the front page. You've changed your name. No. When we're talking about Lazarus, we'd be talking about John chapter 11 and no look. So I get the, I get the sweetie. So, I know it says Luke chapter 11 and 12 on there, but it's actually John chapter 11 and 12. And I'm not going through the whole lot, but... John's Gospel, 21 chapters in John's Gospel. We're going to sort of look at 10 and 12, but... Between chapter 11 and the end is the last week of Jesus' life on this earth. His last week. The whole half of John's Gospel is dedicated to that seven days in the life of Jesus. There's a bit of, what would we say, misunderstanding about what Lazarus' resurrection was all about, but we'll talk about that in a minute. But what I want to say is, don't think that because things are not happening the way you want them to happen, that they won't happen. It's what I call the divine delay. You know, and sometimes when, you, when you're watching somebody on Zoom or maybe you're watching somebody on the television on Zoom, they ask them a question and then it seems to take forever to let me answer back. But they always answer back. But don't be disheartened. People take this Lazarus... Les- That's a fisherman's friend. The Lazarus resurrection is some sort of indication that if you just have enough faith and believe that everybody will be resurrected in the physical. And people have taken that to the sort of extremes and things that I think at the end of Mark's gospel there's a statement that says if you handle poisonous snakes and all the rest of it they'll no harm you and whatever. And there's people in the southern states of America that their whole service is around boxes of snakes and they take them out and they rattle them around and a few of them get bitten and a few of them die but uh, and then they don't get resurrected and then they wonder why if you start going to play with snakes you're going to get bitten <coughs> but one of the strangest things I came across when I was trying to research about this was was in Tennessee where a family the mother had died so they earnestly believed that because Lazarus had been resurrected, their mother was going to get resurrected. And so they kept her for 12 weeks in the house and washed her and did all the things that you need to do. And eventually, if you forgive the pun, the authorities got wind of it. <laughs> and they were charged with abuse of the corpse and all the rest of the stuff. And it just brings Christianity into a disrepute, if you want to call it that rather than accept the will of God because at the end of the day if that woman was truly a Christian as soon as she died she was resurrected in the spiritual rather than the, rather than the physical so that was them in Tennessee the difference is here we have the week before Jesus or probably about 10 days before Jesus was actually crucified and resurrected there was a, another resurrection Lazarus now Martha and Mary You all know the story. Martha and Mary had sent word to Jesus that their friend, the one that, the friend that Jesus really loved was sick. And would he come and help? Now, we know for other things that Jesus did, he didn't need to go. He's healed people for a distance. He's laid hands on them. He's made mud and put it in their eyes. He can do it always. It doesn't need to be that Jesus is there in person but they sent for him and he waited two more days so by the time he got to Bethany where Lazarus was already in the tomb he'd been dead for four days and Martha and Mary when they both came out to meet Jesus said to him 
If you had just been here, my brother wouldn't have died. They couldn't quite get the grasp that Jesus had the power of life and death. And that was the whole point of Lazarus' resurrection. It was a sign. And John talks about signs. He never talks about miracles in John's Gospel. He talks about signs. And all the signs that were there, the very, you can look them up, there's seven of them. And there's seven I am statements and there's seven women that followed Jesus and there's glorious other sevens that are the completion of God's work in the matter. But the first one is Jesus turned the water into wine which was a creation miracle he, from nothing. Didn't he grow the grapes or get anything? He just changed the water into wine immediately. Something that would normally have taken a year to develop the wine properly. Jesus did it in the twinkling of an eye. And this is the last sign, Lazarus' resurrection. So here we are. If you had just been here, how many times have we cried that to the Lord? If you were just there, Lord, if you were just here, but he is here. He's here through the Spirit of the Lord. He doesn't need to be here in a physical presence. He's here for you. All you need to do is put your petitions before him and ask him. And leave it with him. Because often what we do is we tell God the problem and that's good. And then we tell him the answer and say, well, this is what we want. So why are we not getting it? And Martha and Mary, they were the same. If you had just been here. And Jesus said to Martha, he said, your brother will rise again in the last day. And she said to him, I know he'll rise again at the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus' reply was what? I am the resurrection and the life. What a statement to make. I mean, I don't know how astonished Martha must have been at that. She must have thought, what is exactly as he talking about? I am the resurrection and the life. And yet, a few minutes later, when everybody was weeping, all the Jews were out there, all the people that knew Mary and respected Lazarus and all that, they're all there at the funeral. They're all giving the old, as they usually do in Middle Eastern funerals, that the women wail. And Jesus, Jesus wept as he saw this suffering. Where have you laid him, he said. And he stepped forth and he said, Lazarus. In fact, before he said that, he prayed to the Father, he says, Lord, I'm saying this prayer not for me, but for them that hear this, that you can do all things. And I'm asking you now to do this. And he stood up and he said, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came out of the tomb. Still, still bandaged up in his grave clothes. How he did that, I don't know. How he actually got to the door of the tomb, I don't know, because he was, his legs would be tied together with the bandages and his arms would be tied to his side. He would like something out of the film, The Mummy. And the face cloth was still on his face. We'll talk about that another day. But here he was. And what did Jesus say? Take the, gro take the grave clothes off him and set him free. And that's exactly what he says to us. That we're no longer tied to sin and death. He has taken the grave clothes from us and set us free. It may not be in a physical sense, but certainly in a spiritual sense. We should feel no guilt or shame ever, although we do. But at the end of the day, Christ has taken that all for us. So then we get to verse 45, and this is the real the start of the study, I suppose, in some measure. This was the effect, the Lazarus effect, after Lazarus was raised from the dead. And it says in verse 45 in chapter 11 of John, Therefore many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did put their faith in him. So there was a huge crowd there. We know there was a huge crowd there because it tells us in other parts there was a huge crowd there. I don't know what I would have been like if I'd been part of that crowd. If I'd been somebody that had known Lazarus and suddenly here's this guy who had been mourning for four days was suddenly at the, do the door of the tomb. Now, Martha didn't want him to open the tomb because I love the verse in the authorised verse that says, Lord, he stinketh. <laughs> and uh, 
I just I mean that the resurrection was a whole resurrection. It was a complete renewal. It was there wasn't any bits falling off him because he was starting to rot or decay. His liver hadn't he packed in and his heart hadn't he given up and he was actually in total the total man that he was before he died and probably with all the ailments that maybe afflicted him he was maybe even better than he was before he died. And I hope that's what we'll be after we die. It will be far better than we ever were in this life. Far more glory to God for that. So they said, many of the Jews put their faith in him. So I can just imagine people, I can, I can virtually imagine people fainting or falling down on their knees just to see this resurrection and think, what on earth has just happened here? This is historical. There's many, many people over the years, I'm sure, who have been raised from the dead in the name of Jesus Christ. But this, this was the sign that Jesus could overcome the death and overcome sin. We often look at his own resurrection and think, that's the reason, that's the reason why I'm a Christian. But the reason why you're a Christian in some measure is because of the death of Jesus, his resurrection. But the people here believed, not because of Jesus, but because of something he'd done. He'd raised this man from the dead. And many people even today, we believe Jesus because it's something that he's done rather than the someone who done it, who did it, sorry. There was, I found a story about, a, it was written by Josephus, the, the Roman historian who was part Jew, half Jew, I think his mother or his father was a Jew. And he wrote a lot of script, not scripture, but a lot of sort of prose about the time of Jesus. And he said, there was an eminent senator in the Roman Senate who had a son whom he didn't get on very well with. And he decided to write him out his will. So he wrote a new will. And nobody knew what was in the will. But when he died, the lawyers or whoever did it at that time, they took the, the will and they opened it. And they said that all this senator's wealth, which was a great deal of wealth, had been to given to his loyal slave, Marcellus, their law. And the son sat there and said, is there nothing for me? And the lawyer said, well, there's a caveat to the will. You're entitled one thing, so name your one thing. He says, well, I'll take Marcellus. <laughs> so in taking Marcellus, you got everything. When you take Jesus, you get everything. When you're not looking at the something, but looking at the someone, when you take Jesus, everything is added unto you. Seek you first the kingdom of God, and all the rest will be added to you. There's no delay. So some of these people put their trust in him, and there must have been great conversations going on there, but it says at verse 46, but some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. There's still people today who just won't believe and I want to encourage you this morning, you might speak to people who just give you a hard time and say, I can't believe that, and I can't believe that. It happened here. These were people who'd witnessed. Mm -hmm. Witnessed Jesus raising Lazarus for the dead, and yet they couldn't believe it. And you wonder, it's probably one of the most, what would I say about this verse? One of the most discouraging verses I've probably read in the Bible that they saw what Jesus had did and they went to the Pharisees and complained. They were not prepared to give him an inch of room or not prepared to believe anything. So if people can't believe what Jesus did then, right in front of their eyes, how much more are they not going to believe when you tell them who you are and who Jesus is? That's where testimony is such an important thing. You might not be able to say too much about doctrinal issues and all the rest of the stuff but you can tell them what Jesus did for you and you can tell them that at the end of the day the resurrection will be mine because I tell you this irrespective of whether you know Jesus here this morning or not we're all going to be resurrected everybody everybody that's ever lived will be resurrected the difference is that those who know Jesus and have chosen Jesus will be resurrected to life 
And those who don't know him will be resurrected to an eternal death. A living death, if you want to call it that. That's the problem. That's what people don't want to understand. Many, many times I hear on the television and I see people talking and they say, oh, my mummy's looking down on me. She was a drunkard and a drug addict and all the rest. And may well, she may well be, but the chances are she may well not be. So we need to be careful and make sure that we stay on track with Jesus, that we believe who he was. We don't just believe in the things that he did. We don't just, the signs were there as an indication by John about who Jesus was, the Son of God. But don't just believe in the signs. Blessed are those who have seen and yet believed. And blessed are, even blessed more are those who have not seen and yet believed. And I believe sitting here this morning that you've all seen a miracle in Jesus' life. In your life. Carried out by Jesus. If nothing else, your salvation. Something that changed your life. Something that made you, or should I say, resurrected you above the death. The, the curse of sin and death. Anyway, these guys went and told the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the chief priests, we want something done about this man. Look what he's doing over here. So they called a meeting of the Sanhedrin, the chief priests. The chief priests were Sadducees. And the Sadducees would be up, really upset about this because they didn't believe in resurrection. That's why they made so Sadducee. Oh. The groan goes round the church. I was just thinking that, you know, how many times have I cracked that in here? I've stood in front of this fellowship for a Bible study up until now for 32 years, and I'm running out of things to say. You know? So I just go back to the old stuff. So these guys, the Sadducees were the chief priests, they were the aristocracy. It was, the chief priests were always from the aristocracy. They were never Pharisees. The Pharisees believed in the resurrection of the dead, but even they were troubled by this resurrection that Jesus accomplished. And think about the two resurrections. This one of Lazarus was a very, very public resurrection. Anybody and everybody that was around Jerusalem at the time would have seen it. Now, when I say everybody, because this was coming up to Passover, we're only 10 days away, people would have been arriving in droves to Jerusalem. And maybe even bigger droves as the, the word about Jesus spread about this man raising the dead. They wanted to come into Jerusalem to see what was happening. Josephus tells us as well that this particular Passover, this one, that there were 250,000 lambs slaughtered at Passover. 250,000. It was generally one for each family. That they, for the forgiveness of sins, etc. They, they celebrated the Passover that the angel of death might pass over them. A family, a, a, a big family, an extended family might extend to ten people. So that would effectively be that there were two and a half million people in and around Jerusalem at this time. And they were all there with their lambs, giving them to the, to the priests to be slaughtered. They couldn't all be slaughtered in the one day, it would have been impossible. So the, they started killing the lambs and celebrating the Passover that wee bit earlier. So here we are, but that was the public resurrection, so there was probably at least two and a half million people that either had witnessed the resurrection or had heard about the resurrection of Lazarus. Now the resurrection of Jesus was a different thing. It was a very private resurrection. If you look through it and study it properly, you'll find that the only people he appeared to were the people that believed in him before he died. There was nobody else. Nobody else saw him until he ascended into heaven. So these, what are we accomplishing? This, the Pharisees and the Sadducees asked. Here is the man performing many miraculous signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. Then the Romans will come and take away our place and our nation. There's no question about, let's go and talk to the guy and see what's happening here. We just want to be as we are. We just want to be religious. We just want to stand here and criticise. 
let's get rid of this guy because if we don't do something about him the Romans are going to come they're going to take away our place and our nation our place can refer to two things I think some of the commentators would say they're referring to the temple that they would take the temple away from them which they eventually did but others say their place, their place in society. These were the guys who were the sort of supreme leaders. These were the guys who dictated what you could and you couldn't do. And still to this day do. So irrespective, they were not interested in the fact that God was behind this. They were more interested in being religious and sticking to man's rules. And then at verse 49 it says, One of them, named Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, spoke up. You know nothing at all. You do not realise that it is better for you that one man die for the people than that the whole nation perish. Caiaphas, he was the high priest. And it says there, that year. Now, John was writing sort of 50 years further on. That year, it was, he put an imperative on that year. It was the year that Jesus was crucified. That year, Caiaphas was the high priest. Annas was really the high priest but apparently he was involved in that much skullduggery that if he was caught he would have been uh, given the heave hole. so he delegated it to Caiaphas who was his son-in-law so Caiaphas was the head the sort of face of the place but uh, Annas was the guy who worked the puppet for the back it was just a corrupt system totally you see that when you look back at when Jesus emptied the turned over the tables in the temple money changers and, you know you could if you didn't bring a lamb with you you could buy one in the temple grounds but you had to pay four times the price than if you brought one with you it was just a totally corrupt system and Jesus was sick of it and he tipped the tables over and drove the cattle and the sheep out, in, out of the place anyway that's another story so Caiaphas has said it's better for you that one man die than for the for the people in the whole nation, whole nation perish. And at verse 51, John tells us, he did not say these things on his own, but as high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation. And not only for that nation, but also for the scattered children of God, to bring them together and make them one. So from that day on, they plotted to take his life. So that was the day. That was the Lazarus effect that I've spoken about. The Lazarus effect divided the people many who had seen it and believed many who had seen it and were terrified of it these people even Caiaphas John tells us he didn't realise that because he was high priest that year he prophesied this this was a, a, a an unknown prophecy if you want to call it that Caiaphas said it's best that one man die than the whole people die one man die for the whole nation and the whole nation perish. So, if God prophesied through Caiaphas, was Caiaphas a Christian? Don't think so. But it shows us one thing, that God can use anybody. He used a donkey. We see that way in many situations. I remember reading back in one of my favourite books, Ezra and Nehemiah, the two combined. In fact, he was prophet, Jesus, God was prophesying through Isaiah about it. He says, in those days I will send my servant Nebuchadnezzar, the biggest crook, thug, molester in the world, and yet God used him to bring the nation into captivity. And then Cyrus who was the Persian that took over for Nebuchadnezzar. He says in Isaiah, I will bring my shepherd Cyrus to allow my people to go back to Jerusalem. And that was written 500 years before, before Jesus appeared. So God can use anybody. Don't think because somebody says something to you that sounds godly, that it isn't godly. It may well be. Just check it against scripture. And he says that they'll bring, they'll, God will not just 
rescue the, the Jewish nation, but also the scattered children of God, to bring them together and make them one. You are the scattered children of God. You are the people that God would bring together. Remember when Jesus was talking in John about being the good shepherd. He said, I have sheep of another flock. Well, the flock he was talking to were the Jews. And he said, I have a sheep of another flock and I will bring that sheep and the two shall become one and they shall be one people and one God. The saved and the unsaved will be brought together and they'll all be in glory together under one ruler, Jesus Christ, King of Kings. From that day onward, they plotted to take his life. And again, John emphasizes that, that day. That particular day, the day that Lazarus was raised from the dead, the Lazarus effect was that they determined to kill Jesus. They had talked about it before and there was a bit of argument backwards and forwards. But at this point in time, this was the day that they decided to kill Jesus. They didn't want to kill him during the Passover festival, but Jesus forced their hand. Lazarus wasn't raised on that day for no purpose. He wasn't just raised so that people would, would see and believe. He was raised so that the Pharisees and the Sadducees would be forced into a situation where they were forced to arrest Jesus, where they were forced to take him before an illegal court, where they were forced to cry out to Pilate to crucify him. And they were forced to crucify him. It was all in God's plan. And when things don't go right for you guys, think about that. Think about the Lazarus effect because that's what it was. It was the Lazarus effect to me that led up to the actual day that Jesus was crucified. Otherwise, they would probably have got rid of him after the Passover because I think in Mark 4, Mark, Mark 14, sorry, they were, uh, they were ready for killing him then, but it was too early. They wanted to wait. If we try and kill him just now, in Mark 14, they said that the people got upset there might be a riot because Jesus was popular. But now he forced himself into this situation. He forced them into this situation. And so we... So when it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, people went up to the country for their ceremonial cleansing before the Passover. They kept looking for Jesus and as they stood in the temple area, they asked one another, what do you think? Is he coming to the feast at all? But the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that if anyone found out where Jesus was, he should report it so that they might arrest him. So there was the secret service were out looking for Jesus. They were looking for a way to arrest him. And then at chapter 12, just at the start, six days before the Passover, Jesus arrived at Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honour. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. We go back to Mark 14 and we, we see that this was at the house of Simon the leper. And I presume he wasn't a leper anymore. I mean, it's not somebody he would go to dinner with, you know. That's somebody that Jesus probably healed at one point in time. There was even some commentators and, and historians of that time allude to the fact that, that uh, Simon the leper was actually Martha's husband. Can't I guarantee that, but you can do your own research on that one. So here we are. If anybody knows where Jesus is, they should tell the Pharisees and they'll get arrested. Six days before the Passover, Jesus arrived at Bethany. And here he was being fetid for Lazarus being raised for the dead. And Lazarus sitting at the table. I mean, I find that quite extraordinary. I mean, I find it astonishing. I think I've told you this before, or I've said this before. Imagine that I stood up this morning and said, by the way, I'm having a wee meeting on Wednesday. We're going to have a wee potluck supper. But I've got a guy coming who's been dead for four days and they've just raised him from the dead. You want to come? <laughs> would you come? Or would you say, what a load of baloney. How can the guy have been raised from the dead? But that's what people would say. Some people would believe and say, I'll come. Others would say, no, no. No for me. Just the same as they did then because, you know, the problem is that the heart of man has never changed. It's always dark and wickedness. And who can know it? That's what the Bible says about it. 
So here was Martha serving, as usual, while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table. Then Mary, she took a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. In Mark 14, it also says that he got it on his head as well. He was pretty well anointed. I mean, a pint goes a long way. Um, in the old days when I was drinking, I mean, when you spilled a pint, you thought, is it as big as that? <laughs> this great big puddle of beer lying on the floor. You can imagine how much perfume a pint. And it was a very expensive perfume, spike nard, but it was shortened to nard. And uh, it tells us, either here or elsewhere, that it was worth a year's wages. Which I suppose nowadays is about £30,000 or something. I mean, it's a lot of money, even today. So here she was, pouring perfume on him. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. And I say this again, and I've said it many times. That when you take a woman to a place like Marks and Spencer's or some of the big department stores, I just used to sit at the door. Because there wasn't any point in trailing around behind Doreen. <laughs> So I just sat at the door and usually in, the, in these big stores, on the ground floor was the perfumery. So that as you walked past you could get the aroma coming out of the door. And the women would be standing there and they would have a wee spray at this and a wee rub at this. And, no, I don't quite like that. No. Oh, that's quite nice. But think about it. The perfume only smells nice when it's on your skin. No, nobody smelt it straight from the bottle. They put it on their skin first. So to me, here was, here was an indication, almost like the Spirit of God was there, that the aroma of Christ filled the house. Not the aroma of the perfume, the aroma of Christ that filled the house. And here's all these people sitting. I'm sure they'd be sitting eating their pile like that and looking at Lazarus. Is he eating? <laughs> is, I mean, is, he, is it a hologram that's sitting there? I mean, I can't, I, this, this is a, the Lazarus effect as well. Here are all these people. But one of his disciples, we'll get to that bit in a minute, one of the disciples at verse 4 said, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As a keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself. All that was put into it. So even in the midst of this, the Lazarus effect on Judas was that here we've got a chance here to make some money. A pint of nard, oh your beauty. And then when she comes forward, he, he probably thought she was going to lay at his feet, but she didn't. She broke the bottle and she poured it all over him, literally. And Judas said, what's the story here? This, I could have collected money and it would have been given to the poor and all the rest of it. So why would, they give, why would they give Judas the money? Would you pick your most untrustworthy guy in the gang to be the treasurer? I don't think so. But Judas was obviously quite well liked and well trusted and he managed to inveigally sell any people's affections because he held the purse. He was the treasurer. So here he is again in his true colours and it's the Lazarus effect that's brought out his true colours here. It started in him that he wants the money. What did he do for Jesus? He took the money. He surrendered himself, surrendered Jesus to the high priest for the money. He was quite prepared to give up Jesus, the opportunity, give up Mary the opportunity to anoint Jesus by taking the money. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. And that's true. We see over there in the food bank, we'll always have the poor amongst us. But we won't always have Jesus. Meanwhile, in verse 9, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came, not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and putting their faith in him. So the Lazarus effect comes on again. 
We can't have Lazarus walking around telling us that Jesus has resurrected him, so he'll have to die. So they plan to kill Lazarus as well. We don't know anything further than that. But what I say to you this morning is, as we just finish, how powerful is our testimonies? What is the Lazarus effect on you? What has it done for you? That you can be brave enough to tell people, be brave enough to stand up there and say, I don't know much theology and I don't know much about this or that, but I'll tell you this, this is what Jesus has done for me. And people have got two choices. They either accept you or they don't. They either say, well, that's fine for you, but not for me. Or they're, or they're encouraged to believe in Jesus because of what you've told them. So remember, we're at this place where don't always be looking or hoping for Jesus to do something. Look for the someone who's doing it. Because at the end of the day, this delay, this divine delay, this divine delay that was there for Mary and Martha, can you imagine their situation just as I finish here? Their situation would be that he's not coming. We've sent a messenger to him and he's not coming. That's four days and he's, he's not been here. Disappointed, heartbroken. If he had just been here, my brother Lazarus would not have died. And Jesus said, have faith. I want to do something even more fantastical, even more astonishing than making Lazarus well. I'm going to raise him from the dead. And that's something that Jesus will do for us all. Don't worry if there's a divine delay in what you're waiting for. Just wait for Jesus to do it and he'll do it for you. Lord, I thank you this day for your, for your goodness and your grace and your mercy. I thank you for your word this morning. And I pray, Lord, that as we, as we come up to celebrate and celebrate it as, Lord, that ignominious death that you bore for us on the cross, Lord, and that wondrous resurrection. Help us to remember this Lazarus effect, Lord, that has tripped its way down through the ages, Lord, that there are still people, as they were in your days, Lord, that won't believe you. But, Lord, we believe you and ask that you would inspire our hearts with now. In Jesus' name, amen.